Hare Krishna. Thank you very much for coming today. And I'll speak on this topic of self-discovery or self-discipline. You know, how to go on our inner journey. Inner journey. Inner journey. <clears throat> so I'll speak this in three parts and I'll invite you to... Okay. You can also speak any reflections or questions in between. The three points I'll speak is... First point is that we are not our own masters, but we don't have to be our own slaves. <laughs> and second point is that no, we have to learn to contend with ourselves. Learn to contend with, contend with, negotiate and work with ourselves. And then lastly, how bhakti empowers us to best contend with ourselves. So one of the broad principles that when we live our life, we observe that we, even if we resolve to, we can't control ourselves the way we want. Last year I was invited to a, talk, a TV, talk, TV talk show after a, on the occasion of the New Year. So I talked about New Year resolutions. And I had done some study at that time. I found that almost 90 to 95 percent of the resolutions that people make on the occasion of the new year, the new year resolutions are not new. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they had made those resolutions earlier, but they couldn't keep them and now I try to make them again. I'm not talking about people, I think it applies to all of us, it applies to me also. So we find that even when we resolve to do something, but it's not that we cannot make, we are not our own masters. We want to do something, we do it for some time, and I want to change into a new me. Maybe a more devoted, more compassionate, more sensitive, more whatever. We, we want to become a new you, new me, and the new me comes out for a few days. And then when the new me is not looking, the old me comes back. <laughs> so, after some time, when we try for some self-discipline, and it doesn't work, we might just quit and think, this is the way I am, and I just can't change. So now there is this idea, that it can be taken to another extreme, where you say that actually there is no need to discipline yourself. Just be spontaneous. Just, you know, just life is a self-discovery. Just whoever you are, that is what you are. Whatever idea pops up in your mind, whatever desire comes up, whatever image comes up, just go along with it, go with the flow, as they say, go with the flow. So that is one idea of just, just be who you are. They talk about self-acceptance, just the way you are, you are perfect. There is no need to change anything about you. Now at one level, <clears throat> when we, so if we consider that I will just be who I am, it might sound very good, but then we will never live up to our potential. That's like if somebody plays music. If they say, I'll just go on the stage without any rehearsal and just play whatever comes out at that time. Well, something will come out, but it will be far from our best. So even somebody who wants to just express their heart through music, they can't just do it arbitrarily. There is some amount of training, disciplining required. And in one sense, if you use in the sense of music, as we practice music, what essentially happens is purification. Purification means those, those tunes, those sounds that don't fit in, we gradually start removing it. And those that fit in, they start coming out. So one of my main services is writing. So in writing, it is said that there are two aspects. And this principle applies to various other fields also. There is the art of writing and there is the craft of writing. So the craft is about learning the rules of grammar, getting the punctuation, the syntax, all of it right. And the art is where there is 
play of words, there are similes, metaphors and various literary devices which give language its flourish. So now, to learn the craft requires discipline. <coughs> and if somebody has not learned the craft, then the art will not work. It's like we have to design the house carefully first according to serious design principles and then we can decorate it the way we want. So writing, there is a craft of writing which requires discipline. <coughs> discipline, okay, this is how sentences are completed, this is how this punctuation, this is grammar. And without that we wouldn't have coherent communication. But just craft is not enough. If you want to read for pleasure, we don't take up, uh, say, the manual of a uh, washing <coughs> machine to read. Uh, it's all written according to grammar rules. But because there's no art over there, so there's no pleasure in that. So the art requires <coughs> spontaneity. It requires creativity. That is where self-expression comes out. And great authors have their own personal touch which comes out in their writings. So, like in writing, like in music, and similarly in spiritual life, there is a combination of self-discipline self and self-discovery. <coughs> so, self-discipline in writing is to learn the craft. Self-discovery is where we use the art, where we bring out the art. And without self-discipline, self-discovery is not possible. But if you don't go to self-discovery, just stay at self-discipline alone, then it becomes burdensome. So with ourselves, the one extreme is, you know, this is what I want to do, this is how I want to be, and I'm going to rigidly discipline myself. Now, life of rigid discipline might be possible for some people, but for most people, a very rigidly disciplined life seems too mechanical, seems too burdensome. So we need some time for spontaneity. But complete spontaneity will also lead to nothing getting done. So now I was at a I was speaking at Intel in Phoenix. So it's talking about these all these are big achievers, big performers. So I asked them, how many of you complete your work just when the deadline is right next to the call, next right up? At the 11th hour, almost everyone raised their hands. And they said, without deadlines, nothing would get done. So in a sense, some of the deadline brings some discipline. It's only when the discipline that their works gets done. But then they said that, if you want creative ideas, if you want something special, something wonderful to come up, you cannot bring that within deadlines. That just pops up within us. That's self-discovery. So for us, on the spiritual path also, we have certain rules of sadhana bhakti. We have certain principles that we want to follow. And all that is for self-discipline. But bhakti is not just about self-discipline. Bhakti is about how we as individuals offer our heart to Krishna. And yes, there is certain amount of, like the, for the craft, learning the craft, discipline is required craft of writing, but then the art comes out. So Srila Prabhupada uh, was very, very appreciative and enthusiastic about devotees doing book distribution. And there were some devotees who were experts at book distribution and they once said to Prabhupada that we have found out certain lines. If you speak these lines, then you know, people just take the books. So they said, we want to go around the world give seminars on uh, how devotees can speak these lines and they can distribute your books in huge quantities. And Prabhupada became very grave. Very what? Became very grave. Grave. He grave. And he said that devotional service is individual, voluntary and spontaneous. When a soul is inspired to serve Krishna, then devotional service is performed. So Prabhupada said, don't teach the lines to people, inspire, in, don't teach the lines to devotees, inspire devotees to distribute books. And then they will speak according to their convictions. So we can learn a few lines, but the important thing is that our heart needs to be infused with the desire to serve Krishna. 
and when that desire is there then the service becomes manifested in a way that is individual and personal for us so bhakti has both these aspects now some amount of self discipline is required in sadhana bhakti but discipline is something which can seem like a endless burden <laughs> it is like i just gave a seminar in in singapore as well as in brisbane on burn anger before anger burns you so burn anger before anger burns you and i spoke about how sometimes some people are short tempered and they make a resolution i will never get angry again i will never get angry again now when we make a resolution like that there is no success in that resolution there is only the possibility of failure <laughs> because even if i succeed for 6 months and not get angry so i have not got angry for 180 days but on the 181st day when i get angry the 180 days of success there's no satisfaction that i failed after so long that is the dissatisfaction that comes so when we just focus on self discipline then often it's like a goal which becomes a burden i have to achieve it but okay i have to achieve it for the rest of i have to keep doing it for the rest of my life it can start becoming a burden so then in that seminar i was telling that we can t- the mind needs to be tricked so that it can accept it. so i said instead of making a resolution that i will never become angry make a positive resolution that you know, i will respect everyone's right to be spoken to politely mm-hmm. that you know, even if i have done something wrong i would want that other people speak politely to me everyone has a right to be spoken to politely so when we make that positive resolution then what is happening the focus is shifting from me and my controlling myself to my extending my thought to other people yeah this person has a right to be spoken to politely how can i speak politely so when we shift it that way there is a certain amount of there is a certain amount of channelizing of energy that comes up because when we say i don't i won't get angry all that is happening i'm disciplined 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 curb myself curb myself and angry and upset but curb myself but when i say i'll respect everyone's right to be spoken to politely what I, what is happening by that change resolution okay okay how can i be polite to this person how can i be courteous to this person so the, when the focus shifts to the other person that they they are also conscious beings they are also having emotions how can i respect their right to be spoken to politely and that brings a positive channeling of the energy and when we do that each person because each of us because we are individuals we may express our appreciation our respect our emotions for each other in distinctive ways so in bhakti this self discovery is how we can individually find out how best we can connect with krishna so to be to be our own master means this is what i am going to do and that is this to be our to want to be our own master means to make self discipline our supreme value uh, to be our own slave means to just do whatever feels good to become like completely sold out to self discovery okay whatever comes up i'll speak that whatever i feel i'll do that so we need a balance of both of them and in bhakti there are certain rules and regulations you have to follow which require self discipline but apart from those rules and regulations there is a whole universe in which each one of us can find out how best we can serve krishna so each one of us is a individual person we have our mind we have our own body we have our own uh, skills our own inspirations our own ideas and through it all we think how can i serve krishna so when we have this then bhakti has gets a element of self discovery i met a rupa disciple in alachua some of me know rochan prabhu so he he i read about him in the prabhupad memories so this is very instructive past time for me so he was in england and england london at that time was the european headquarters so devotees from germany from france 
from Netherlands, various places had come there and they were giving reports of the outreach happening in those countries. And this devotee thought that everybody has some service for Prabhupada, but I don't have any service. So then he went to Prabhupada, Prabhupada, what can I do for you? And Prabhupada looked at him and said, what do you want to do for Krishna? No, Prabhupada, whatever you tell me, I'll do. No, Prabhupada said, I'm asking you, what do you want to, what do you want to do for Krishna? He said, thought, maybe Prabhupada is testing me, testing my surrender. So, Prabhupada, whatever you tell me, I'm do. And Prabhupada said, very gravely, said, understand our philosophy. Just find out something that you like to do and do it for Krishna. Find out something that you like to do and do it for Krishna. So this is self-discovery. He said, I had never thought of Krishna Bhakti like that. He said, Prabhupada, I had to think about it. And then he went and he thought about it in a couple of days. He said, Prabhupada, I like to make things with plaster of Paris. With so I am thinking that we have these brudangas which we get from India. Sometimes they break. So I will use locally available material and make brudangas with that. And Prabhupada said, very good. He says, he said, your western god brothers are very passionate. He says, make a mrudanga that even if they throw it down, it will not break. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is what Prabhupada talk. This is one? Yeah. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> so, you have a demonstration of that. <laughs> no, no, no. no. <laughs> okay, so, that's self-discovery. So, when we understand it, okay, there's self-discipline, but there's also self-discovery in bhakti. Then bhakti doesn't become all this about, I have to follow this and I can't follow it. Oh, I am I am useless, I am hopeless, I am so fallen. No, we all need some amount of encouragement and stimulation in our devotion. And when we have this aspect of self-discovery, so what Prabhupada said, find out something that you like to do and do it for Krishna. That is where self-discovery comes out. So this was the first point I was going to make that just as in writing there is art and craft, just in self, uh, just for us to deal with ourselves, we can't be our own masters, sticking only to self-discipline, but we can't be our own slave, slaves, just giving in to whatever we feel like doing, in the name of self-expression or self-acceptance or self-discovery. We need a balance. So the rules and regulations of bhakti bring about self-discipline, but the principle of individually serving Krishna gives us opportunity for self-discovery. So any comments or questions? Yes, yeah, it's very interesting that um, you, you mentioned that Srila Prabhupada told the book distributors that um, devotional service is individual, voluntary, and spontaneous. Yeah. And he also told that to Karandar in a letter um, in 1972. When he, Karandar Prabhu was uh, GBC for California. And he was saying how the same principle that uh, devotees should be engaged according to their their propensity, yeah? how they would like to serve Krishna. And he says it's your duty as managers to inspire them to want to serve Krishna. So th this is the first time I've heard individual, spontaneous, and voluntary in another in another relationship. Because to me that was very profound what he said. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. Yes. For me, yeah. For me also it was a revealing. Finding, which generally we think about do these rules, follow the instruction of the spiritual master, and that's of course important. But if the spiritual master is not there with us, then we have to find out how we best can engage ourselves. And for that's where the self discovery aspect comes out very, uh, uh, very helpful in making our own devotional service sustainable. Because if something we like to do, then we can ourselves do it with anyone, anyone, without anyone pushing us or anyone having to remind us. And so it becomes sustainable. Thank you. Yeah. Another thing is, is that thank you very much for, for making this principle because I just retired. I'm trying to find myself. You know, I'm very in a very flux. So I want I want to I want to discipline myself to <coughs> increase my number of rounds and so forth and discipline, but I also want to discover myself. So thank you. Oh, thank okay. you. Yeah. Yeah. In nineteen uh Maybe 75. Uh, my son was in Dallas Spirit College under the Prabhu. I don't know where she is right now. She was one of the teachers there, and the school closed. And Prabhupada said, Okay, we will take all the children to India. 
the Dilgo Gurukula in India. And uh, the temple president in those days, devotees were like a deck of cards. So they were feeling the devotees, okay, you go here, you go there. So I went to Mayapur festival and I attended one of Prabhupada's darshans. And um, I heard he liked macadamia nuts, so I had a big basket of macadamia nuts. And on the top I wrote a little letter because I couldn't go through his secretary and his bodyguards and the GBCs. And, and on the letter I said, I just want to do Sankirtan for Vrindavan Gurukula because I'll be thinking about that anyway because that's where my son is. <coughs> they were going to send me to who knows where. And um, Kamal Krishna Maharaj at that time, he was very high up. And he came and he found me and he said, Shri Prabhupada said yes. So, Beautiful. Way. So uh, we formed a a woman's party, and we distributed books with the Radha Damodar traveling second time wow. devotee. In India or in America? All over America. Oh, okay. But, um, but it's in that same mood. Prabhupada facilitated your desire. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. And the Chaitanya Bhagavat. The Kazi, the Muslim Kazi and another Muslim, they're speaking to Haridas Thakur and they're telling, look, you know, you took birth in a Muslim family, now you have to return to the fold, you have to recite the Kalmasha, you have to come back to your, how you, where you were born. So what did he tell them? Suno Bap Sabari Eki Ishwar. Jay Iswar, Jay, uh, say Iswar, yeah. Jay Iswar, say Iswar, Jare Jano Loa Man, say Mata Karma Kore Sakal Bhuvan. Jay Iswar, say Puna Shabar Bhav Loe, Himsa Kurile, say Tahan Himsa Hoi. Eteke Amare, Say Iswar Jehano Lowayachanda Chitte Ami Kori Tenu. So he told them, look, Funo Bap, listen man, or listen boy. Everybody worships the same Ishwar. And how now the word that's used is lawa, to take. But in the first instance, the meaning is that however Krishna, the Ishwar, however Ishwar is inspiring everyone, they are acting according to that inspiration. But now comes the important part. Jai Ishwar Shai Puna Shabar Bhav Loy. Just like the rain falling during the Swati Nakshatra, it lands on the ocean, it becomes pearls, it lands somewhere else, it becomes another kind of jewel. So Krishna is inspiring everyone, but according to where the inspiration lands, that person will have a certain bhav, and Krishna will reciprocate with that person's individual, um, how they have accepted this inspiration. Just like Prabhupada was saying, what do you want to do? Beautiful. And then finally he says, Eteke amare Say Iswar Jai Hano Lowayach in the Chitte Ami Kori Ten. I am simply acting as I have been inspired by the Ishwar. So, without that uh, magic ingredient, inspiration, then how the self discovery can come? It needs a spark. So, it's a question or a comment? I don't know. <laughs> 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 just came out of my mouth. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You know, so, you say, Hridas Thakur says that it is how the, the way the Lord inspires, everybody approaches Him accordingly. Mm -hmm. So, without that spark coming from the Lord, can we have that self discovery ourselves? I, yeah, I think it's a reciprocal process. It's uh, whatever little we know about ourselves, 
See, we are ourselves also quite complex beings in the sense that we have different kinds of desires, different kinds of interests. Uh, so whatever we understand about ourselves, we use that and act accordingly. And in our period of time, yeah, this works well. This doesn't work so well. We understand. So you know, I, I just, I have a whole seminar on I given colleges about how to discover your purpose in life. People, people are not interested in hearing about the ultimate purpose of going back to Krishna. <laughs> they say, okay, how can I act and how can I contribute in this world? So I talk about the ultimate purpose, but I also talk about this. So in that I talk about three things. That there is purpose, sorry, problem, potential and process. That means, is there something wrong in the world which you feel needs to be fixed? It could be something very simple, oh, books are not being, in our devotee movement, we say books are not being distributed, kirtan is not happening so nicely, preaching is not happening, the deities are not being worshipped, the cooking is not done so well. Is there some problem out there which you feel, oh, this should be fixed? It's something we feel that needs to be fixed in the world. It could be in our small world, and then that's a problem. Then second is potential. Do I have the ability to fix it? So... Broadly speaking, if we are good at something, then we say work according to our propensity. That propensity comes out in two ways. It's competence and comfort. Com so com competence and comfort. Competence. So competence means when we are working, we are good at doing it. And comfort means we feel nice, we feel happy doing it. So that's the potential. And then third is the process. So is okay, this particular thing is not happening. I have the ability to do it. Now, is there a way I can work to fix it? So, if you look at these three things, now we might ourselves feel like, okay, that, okay, this is not working well. So then, okay, let me try to do it. So, self-discovery doesn't have to be like one day I wake up and I know this is a, this is what I am meant to do for Krishna. Now, we may have to try different things and eventually find out something that works, and we continue that. So, Krishna's inspiration didn't have to come like one life-changing insight, Krishna's inspiration can also come as a, a gradual orientation of our life. This is, this is where I meant to go. This is how I can best contribute. So it can come both ways. I have a question. Yeah, please. Um, it, it's actually been, it's, it's, sometimes it's kind of confusing to figure out like what you're supposed to do because like if you have a lot of maybe some different types of talents, mm -hmm. And then, um, and then you also, in the Gita, it says, even if you're good at something, you should just do the thing that you're supposed to do, like, do your duty, even if you might be better at somebody else's duty or something like that. It just, it makes it confusing because then you wonder, like, you want to do your duty, but what is your duty and how can you tell what your duty is? And if, and if in Gita, it's actually saying that you, even if you do it better, you should still do your, your actual duty, like even if you do something else better. So it makes me feel like a little bit confused because I'm thinking, what's, what's my duty? And then there's so many different things that I can actually okay. do. <laughs> yeah, okay. So I think there are two separate points over here. So what does, what does the Gita say that we should stick to our duty even if we can do some something else better? So, actually let's look at the exact verse. Krishna speaks this twice in the Bhagavad Gita in 3.35 and then 18.47. 3.35 says, Shreyan Swadharma Viguna Paradharma Atsvanushtitat Swadharme Nidhanam Shreya Paradharmo Bhayavaha So, Shreyan Swadharma Viguna Do your own dharma even if it is faulty. Paradharma Atsvanushtitat As compared to others' duty, our own duty, it is better to be situated in your own duty. <coughs> Swadharme nidhanam shreya. Even destruction in one's own duty is better than paradharmo bhayavaha. Paradharmo bhaya. To do another's duty is fearful. And same thing Krishna replies later, repeats later, in 18.47 he says, Shreyan swadharmo vivuna paradharma swadhushtita. Sabhav niyatam karma kurvan napnoti kilvisham. If you work according to your nature, then you will not be bound. There's no 
and that more bondage that will happen by that so if you look specifically at the context of the gita arjun is a kshatriya and he about has to about is about to fight a war but he thinks that let's forgive the kauravas for whatever then i will live in a forest and let everything be as it is so no forgiveness is is a brahmanical virtue and brahmana at an individual level can and should be forgiving but a kshatriya is meant to manage a state and if kshatriya starts forgiving wrong doers <laughs> the wrong doers will simply keep doing more and more wrongs <laughs> so arjun is a kshatriya and the pan kauravas have repeatedly again and again done not just wrong but more and more brazen wrongs and not in the slightest repentance at all so they had to be punished so when arjun says i will not fight the war he is acting like a brahmana and krishna tells him arjun you have the nature of kshatriya you cannot act like a brahmana <laughs> so even if you think that okay in fighting this war you may you may have to kill your relatives or you may yourself die he says it is better for you to act as a kshatriya because that is your nature so even if it is viguna even if there is some fault in doing your kshatriya duty still do your duty because then you will be accordance with dharma and vishwanath chakra thakur in his commentary the same thing comes later also in 1858 59 60 where krishna says to arjuna that swabhava jina kante nibaddha svena karmana kartum nichchasi anmoha karishyasya vashopitad and everyone is forced to act according to their nature and if you give up your nature it will not work and he says so vishwanath chakra thakur there in his commentary says oh arjun you are saying that you will live like a mendicant like a brahmana on charity but it will not work he says the akshat a brahmana takes charities like this stretch out the hands and take some arms akshatriya takes taxes it's like this you know <laughs> taxes 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 you know you, have, you it's going to take it the people want to give it or not kshatriya will take out the government will come and take taxes so <clears throat> as they say in after death the thing that is sure is taxes <laughs> so now he's saying that you have that nature of kshatriya so if you go and beg for arms and somebody says no we will not give you arms so he says immediately your hand will go to your sword and will take out a sword how dare you don't give me arms <laughs> and he says when you take up arms like that you will be doing adharma because you are acting you are you are taken on the role of a brahmana but you are acting like a kshatriya and for a brahmana to for a kshatriya to take up weapons is fine for a brahmana it is not so krishna is telling arjun that he will not be able to sustain your kshatriya your your brahmana activities and that's why eventually you will do adharma so therefore the, the stress of the gita is for arjuna to act according to his, his nature and that means when he is saying that it is better to do your own duty he is not so much talking about the about the capacity to do it better but rather the capacity means the expertise but is a mentality in psychology He says you don't have the nature of a brahmana. You will not be able to sustain yourself if you act as a brahmana. So that is the primary meaning in the context of the Gita. Now, specifically in our situation, say if we have many different talents, and then we have we may be confused of what is the duty that we should do with our various talents and abilities. Should we just stick to our duty? If we live in a hmm, we live in an age which is significantly different from say the vedic times and desha kala vibhagavita or desha kala dharmagyo the bhagavatam says that according to time and place uh, we have to perform our duties our dharma so basically for each one of us now our duty refers to we have certain social roles and certain responsibilities or expectations according to those roles now we act according to those roles but in today's world these ro- the roles themselves may not be fixed 
they may be fluid and if the roles are fluid we have to see the whole principle of sticking to duty is that we can be in harmony with our material nature while we are striving to come into harmony with Krishna. I'll repeat that. We live in harmony with our material nature while we strive to come to harmony with Krishna. Come to harmony with Krishna means develop a pure, pure service attitude. But live in harmony with our material nature means whatever it is that we naturally love to do. We, so Kshatriya likes to manage, to delegate, to get things done. Uh, Brahmana likes to be intellectual, analyze, write, teach. So if you are in harmony with our nature and then we are pursuing to be in harmony with Krishna. That is a, that is a relatively joyful way of practicing Bhakti. So regarding our duty, we just see that there is something which we have to do because of our particular role in society. But there is something which we be inspired to do also. So it's not that we, have, we give up what we have to do to take up what we are inspired to do. But we try to create a balance between the two. It's not that because I have this duty, that is what I have to, that alone I have to stick to life. That it is, <clears throat> say, one example of Prabhupada's resourcefulness was with respect to gender roles. When gender roles in, when Prabhupada was in India, he generally encouraged uh, women to take up traditional roles of being homemakers. But with, when he was in the West, his disciples, all the devotees, he observed that they were all very resourceful, men, women. So he didn't tell them you have to conform to this. So our nature doesn't just come from our past lives. Our nature also comes by our upbringing. So if somebody has been, say, Prabhupada encouraged people to build farm communities and devotees. Now, if somebody has always lived in the city and then we tell them to go and live in a farm. Now, so some people, they are burned up with city life and they find farm very good. But for some people, the living in the farm itself is so exhausting that instead of having more time to practice bhakti, they have no energy left to practice bhakti. Along with the austerity in the farm. Or austerity of living in the farm. So the principle is that we don't have to make bhakti more difficult than what it needs to be. <laughs> So, if, so, if some, somebody has lived in a city environment where they have some basic comforts and that's what they need, so then their mind will be peaceful and then they can practice bhakti. Now, if somebody has lived in a relatively austere place, aus, aus, relatively austere place in the say, rural setting, now if they get city luxuries, that might distract them from Krishna. So, we have, we could say like a particular optimum level of material engagement which helps us to focus on Krishna. If it is less than that, or if it is more than that, it becomes a problem. So what is that optimum engagement? We need to find out for ourselves by our intelligence and our experience. By our intelligence we observe ourselves and the experiences we work on things. I say, yeah, this is good. This is not very fulfilling. Then gradually we gravitate towards uh, that optimum engagement. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Like with Gajendra and the crocodile. Yeah, excellent. You know, he was in the water and he couldn't <laughs> fight over there. It's <laughs> a good example. Thank you. So that is the first point I made that we are neither our masters nor our slaves. Actually, the second point came up in the discussion itself. But I just make it personal that we have to learn to contend with ourselves. Con contend. 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 Con not content. 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 Contend with ourselves. Contend means... Like we have to say, if we have to work with someone who is not very obedient, uh, then we have to bargain with them. Okay, you do this, I will do this. So, we have to contend with ourselves. That means we can't, because we can't force ourselves to do what we, whatever we plan to do. But at the same time, we can't let ourselves do whatever we feel like doing. So, we have to contend with ourselves. Okay, this is what you like to do, you do this. But this is what you have to do, you do this also. So if you do this, then you can do this. So basically, the whole idea of uh, uh, contending with ourselves is that Krishna says, for example, in the Bhagavad Gita 6.5, he says, 
उद्धरेत्मनात्मात्मसाधेत आत्मयात्मनो बंध आत्म ऋपुरात्म एलिवेट योर सेल्फ विथ योर सेल्फ डोंट डिग्रेड योर सेल्फ विथ योर सेल्फ नैशी द संस्कृत वर्ड इज आत्मा एंड प्रभु पर ट्रांसलेटर इज द माइंड एंड बिकम्स अ लिटल मोर अंडरस्टैंडेबल Otherwise, you say, yes, elevate yourself with yourself. Don't degrade yourself with yourself. The self is the enemy of the self, and the self is the friend of the self. <laughs> What is the self? <laughs> you might get confused by that. Now we can separate it. Okay, Krishna is saying, uh, elevate yourself with your mind, and don't degrade yourself with your mind. But it's interesting when Krishna is saying, El- uh, uh, elevate yourself. He is not saying elevate yourself simply by controlling your mind. elevate yourself with your mind it's not that we keep the mind down and we rise up the mind is always with us and we can't just abandon the mind so the mind is a part of the vehicle that we have so the body the body and the mind are the vehicle that the soul has when krishna says elevate yourself with the mind that means use the mind as a tool to elevate yourself not that you just throw the mind aside and then you rise up towards krishna it doesn't work like that the mind is our constant companion so yeah uh i i'm neophyte with the philosophy but my understanding is that the true intelligence is in our heart from krishna from me comes all knowledge and memory Correct, and yeah. forgetfulness and with that intelligence to control the mind No? Yes, correct. See, no. but my point here is, when I say with intelligence we control our mind, with intelligence coming from Krishna, that is true, no doubt. At the same time, we don't have neat little boxes inside us. No. This is the mind. This is the intelligence. The mind is saying this. No, intelligence is saying this. Yes. There is. There are no ident easily identifiable boxes like that. So, the, when something comes up within us, now how do we know? whether it is a impulse coming from the mind or it is a it is a guidance coming from the intelligence or coming from krishna so it's not that we can we can look at their source and identify it what we can broadly do is focus not on where something is coming from but where something is taking us so okay if i act on this is it going to take me closer to krishna is it going to help me become a better person a better devotee or is this going to pull me down so based on the result of where something is taking us we can broadly infer so when krishna he, if you see in that section 6.5 and 6 krishna is probably talk just talking about we and our mind we and our mind elevate yourself with your mind don't degrade yourself with the mind so that means here when krishna is saying you we he includes the intelligence use your intelligence to engage the mind in a constructive way Say for example, right now we are mm, and we are trying to have this discussion. So now the mind might be distracted, but we are focusing the mind. So one way to understand this is that if you have a big computer screen, mm, and sometimes when people have big monitors, they may have multiple windows open. Mm. Or I was yeah. many places, but I was in London at. a big uh, big building so they had at they had a security office so that building had five different doors and there were a, a cctv camera at all the doors and from there the camera input was coming on a big screen and the security in charge was sitting on and looking at that all the windows and if any place any door he would see somebody suspicious coming in he press the button a zoom in and that cam that particular window would zoom out and fill the whole screen so we could say our mind is like that big screen uh, and on that mind there are different windows say for example right now when i'm speaking something the the sound window is open the sight window is also there but then eh you might be feeling oh it's a little too hot a little too cold so when you feel that okay It's manageable. This for some time I can manage it. But if if you feel it's become too cold, okay, then I I need to get some cloth. I'll cover myself. Then I'm ready. So basically, when some other window come opens up, 
at that when that window pops up then we decide if we pay attention to it it'll zoom out but if it, we don't pay attention to it it will stay minimized and then we can focus on that particular window so but the point is that even to concentrate on krishna we need to use the mind so that's why krishna says man mana bhav fix your mind on me so we can't leave the mind behind and go towards krishna it is we use the mind so the mind is like that screen on that screen all kinds of temptations can come on that screen krishna can also come so is your thing thinking of the mind as one thing it's like one screen with many images on it many windows open so our expertise or our intelligence is to know which window to zoom out and which window to minimize so that is where our control is so ultimately we can't we can't uh, do our duty of our we cannot be thoughtful unless the mind is somehow involved but the thoughtfulness is in <coughs> making sure that the window which we want opens up so i write on the gita every day an article on my website called gita daily so there i wrote an article recently It says we are always full of thoughts but we aren't always thoughtful <laughs> so we are always full of thoughts that means on that inner screen there are many windows that always open that inner screen is never blank but we are not always thoughtful means the window that is important it's not that we always give attention to that sometimes some unwanted some casual idea comes up and we spend a lot of time on that something important Uh, we neglect it so we need that inner screen we need the mind for our functioning that's the point i was making yeah so it's also reminding me that in the gita it's also saying that uh, the uncontrolled mind becomes one's enemy and uh, they start krishna is talking how to make your mind your friend exactly so when your mind is your friend then it can be your, your greatest friend and help you so many ways that's true so that means on the inner screen if the images that are good for us that comes then it's our friend but the unwanted images keep popping up again and again then it becomes like our enemy yeah thank you so with respect to we need to contend with ourselves means that i was talking about that point that contending with ourselves means recognizing that you know okay this is the kind of screen i have right now these are these are these are the windows that are open and i can't suddenly want that some other window these all windows disappear and some other window comes over it these are the windows that i have okay among these which should i focus on among the oh, which one should i focus on okay this one this one is good it may not be the best one but this is what i have let me focus okay it's got discharged now mm-hmm. can you turn that on Hey, Krishna, please. Okay. Good. Yeah. It's working. Oh. Tell me, can you just can you put this for charging somewhere? contend with ourselves means that this is the screen which i have right now this is the window that are open among these which is the best i can use and sometimes we want our life to be very different from what it is right now i want to do this i want to be like this i want this kind of relationships i want this kind of service but we we can't we can't begin in our life unless we begin with our life <laughs> we can't begin in our life okay i want to go there say if i want to drive somewhere and then i have taken a wrong turn and i got somewhere else now i can beat myself what a fool i am what a fool i didn't take a wrong turn but if i have to get where i want to go 
I have to begin from where I am. So we can't begin in our life unless we begin with our life. So if our mind is in some ways uncontrolled, mind has certain likes, certain dislikes, we need to acknowledge this is where I am and from there we move forward. Okay, this is what I can do right now, this I will do later. We need to contend with ourselves. And so when we decide, okay, I want to do this for improving myself. Sometimes we try to take up too many things for improving ourselves. And then, okay, I want to improve my chanting also. I want to improve my study of scripture also. I want to do my beauty worship better. I want to chant my rounds better. And we try to do everything better. We do it for one day, two day, one week, and it becomes such a burden that we give up everything after this. Okay, let me plan for the next one month. I'm going to focus on improving my chanting. Then maybe next one month, I'll focus on studying Shastra more. And then next one, okay, I can focus on more my relationship with devotees. So when we do that, in a, okay, one thing at a time, then we feel that we are achieving something in that direction, and then we can shift also. So we need to contend with ourselves. That was the second point I was speaking on, that rather than expecting that I should be able to obey myself, or that I will just go along with whatever I feel like doing, we contend with ourselves. This is where I am, and from here, let me move forward. So any comments about this point? Okay, so I'll move on to the third point, at the last point. Right? Now, Krishna helps us to bring out our best. So, continuing with that traveling example, say if we were using a GPS, and the GPS told us turn right, but we turn left, and we went far away from where we wanted to go. Now, if we want to turn right, and we turn left, then what does the GPS do? It reroutes us. Does the GPS say, you didn't obey me, get lost. <laughs> GPS never says that. And Krishna is like the ultimate GPS. So, no matter how many wrong turns we may have taken, no matter how many mistakes we have made, so Krishna still is there with us to guide us. So, sometimes we think that we think of Krishna's plan like one line. If I go along this path, I am calling that Krishna's plan is working in my life. And I have gone off that path, that means now Krishna's plan is not there. But it's not like that. No, Krishna's plan is too big to be thwarted by our mistakes or our wrongdoings. So, even if we take some wrong turns in our life, that doesn't mean that Krishna's plan stops acting. Now, there's a difference here between, I'll talk between, uh, this, uh, there's a difference between Krishna's plan and Krishna's purpose. What do I mean by difference? Let's take an example of a, a classroom or a school. Now, in a school, there are exams. If the student fails in the exam, the school has a plan for that. If you fail in one subject, you go to the next level, but do this subject again. The subject you have failed in three, four subjects, so better stay in this level and do this year again. So now that means even if a student fails, the school has a plan for the student. Just because of failure, the student doesn't go out of the school's plan. But the school's plan, the school has a plan for those students who fail, but the school's purpose is not that students fail. The school's purpose is that the students pass and move to the next level. So Krishna doesn't want us to fail, Krishna doesn't cause us to fail, but if we fail, we don't go out of Krishna's plan. So similarly, we, some of us, you know, we may, because of our conditionings or conditions, have taken some wrong turns. And those wrong turns may have consequences. It's like if, in Google Maps also, by using GPS, if we take a wrong turn, it's not that the wrong turn doesn't matter. The wrong turn does matter in the sense that getting to our destination will take time, more time, more fuel. But just because we are taking a wrong turn doesn't mean we are lost forever. The guidance of the GPS is still there for us. So similarly, 
even if we have happened to take some wrong turns in the past, even if we resolved to do something and we made a complete mess of our lives because of some things that we did, still, we are within the purview of Krishna's plan. It's like, even if I take a wrong turn, still, we are within the purview of the GPS. And from there, the GPS can guide us. So Krishna doesn't reject us because of our mistakes. In fact, sometimes our mistakes may make us want to connect with Him more. So when we are contending with ourselves, okay, I want to do this, and I will not do this. But sometimes we will not be able to stick to what we plan to do. But even if that happens, rather than getting disheartened, we rise and resume our connection with Krishna. Okay, I took a wrong turn. Let me now take a right turn. Let me take a right turn and let me move on. And if we persevere on that journey toward Krishna, then we start understanding ourselves better and start connecting ourselves with, better, with Krishna better and better. So Krishna, Krishna always loves us. And he is, can you guess how far Krishna is from us? He's in our hearts, right here. So he is just one thought away. One thought away. The, the soul and the super soul, the bridge between them is just one thought. If you think about him, that we are connected with Krishna. Even if we don't immediately feel his presence, that connection is there. Even if the person who loves us the most, they hug us in the tightest of hugs, but still they can't come as close to us as Krishna always is. So Krishna never forsakes us, no matter whatever mistakes we might make. In the Gajendra's prayer, it says, Madhru Prapanna Pashupasha Vimokshanaya Muktaya Bhuri Karunaya Namolayaya So, the Gajendra is praying that, My dear Lord, please release me from this. Pashupasha is caught by a crocodile and we are also caught by the crocodile of our conditionings. So he says, Pashupasha Vimokshanaya The Lord may say, Why should I liberate you? Why should I free you? Because muktaya. My dear Lord, because you are free. And if somebody is bound and somebody else is free, naturally a, a bound person will say, I want, let me free you. Muktaya. But the Lord may say that you are bound by your own karma. So it is you only did misdeeds and as a consequence you are bound. So why should I free you? It's bhūr karunaya. Yes, my dear Lord, because you are very compassionate. Although I don't deserve to be freed by my karma, I deserve to be bound. But because you are compassionate, so in spite of our my bad karma, you free, please free me. And the Lord may say, I have been trying to free you for so long. But you never, you didn't get free. You chose not to get free. I free you and you bound your bind yourself again. So then he says, My dear Lord, oh Lalaya, you never get tired of that. You never get tired of trying to help us. So therefore, you are untiring. And therefore, oh Lord, please release me. So Krishna is like that. He is untiring. He is present close to us in our hearts. And his purpose is not to catch us when we are wrong. Ah, you did that mistake? Now suffer this consequence. That is not Krishna's mood. Krishna's purpose is to catch us when we fall. It's like a mother is helping a child learn and a child takes a few steps and falls. Now when the child falls, the mother doesn't clap happy. Hey, you fell down. But the mother runs over there and catches the child. So Krishna is like that. Krishna, his purpose is to catch us when we fall. And that's why he is always there with us. So, we, we talk about various kinds of faith. There is faith in Krishna's existence. There is faith in Krishna's intelligence. There is faith in Krishna's uh, Krishna's divinity. There is faith. The, the greatest faith that we that can help us 
move on always in our life yes. is faith in Krishna's benevolence. Mercy. That Krishna always cares for us. And Krishna will never abandon us. So if we can have that faith that Krishna will never abandon us, then we will never lose heart and we will never abandon Krishna. So if we don't lose heart, if we just keep taking steps forward, whatever steps we can in our journey toward Krishna, sometimes the steps will be small, sometimes the small steps will be big. But the small steps we keep to, to, going toward Krishna, and Krishna will bridge whatever distance remains. So sometimes in our spiritual life, if we become proud, oh, I'm so spiritually advanced, <laughs> then we can look ahead, look at the Goswami, look at Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, look at their exalted levels of love, and then understand, I have a long way to go. There's nothing to be proud of. But if we become discouraged, then we can look behind and see how far we have come. If we look at ourselves, how we were 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, there's definitely a difference. The difference in our values, different in our purpose in life. So, despite our conditionings, despite our half-heartedness, Despite our offenses, despite our wrongdoings, Krishna has brought us a long distance. That same Krishna who has brought us so far, that Krishna will take us all the way ahead also. So whenever we become discouraged, we look back and see. That yes, we practice bhakti, but most of the times, we have advanced not because of ourselves, but in spite of ourselves. <laughs> We had this attachment, this distraction, this offensive. But in spite of that, we have come so far. So, if we have come this far by Krishna's mercy, then surely that Krishna will take us in our inner journey ultimately towards Him. That is our hope and that is our confidence. So, I'll summarize. I spoke on this theme of self discipline and self discovery, uh, moving in our inner journey. And I spoke about first three points. The first point was that we are not our own masters, but we don't have to be our own slaves. So be our own masters means have rigid self-discipline. So we, but that is not so sustainable. Because we are not like machines who will just operate according to our discipline. But then the other extreme is self-expression. I'll just be who I am. That's self-discovery, self-expression, self-acceptance. If that is taken to an extreme, then we will never improve. Like a musician, they want to express themselves. But before that, they have to learn the basics of music. A writer may want to express oneself. So then writing as a craft, which requires self-discipline. And writing as an art, which is self-expression or self-discovery. So the, the for us also in our spiritual life, there is the rules of bhakti, which are the part of self-discipline. And the self-discovery self is how we, according to, as Bhakti, Prabhupada said, Bhakti is individual, voluntary and spontaneous. Find out something that you like to do and then do it for Krishna. So we look for some problem that we feel needs to be fixed, some potential that we have and some process by which we can deal with it. So we can link the potential to the problem. So that way, we can be making our offering to Krishna. This, then I talk, second point is that we need to learn to contend with ourselves. Content with ourselves means like, like we would get some other person to do certain things with a to and fro kind of negotiation. So similarly, we need to <coughs> we need to elevate ourselves with our mind. Not that we can leave our mind behind and elevate, become elevated. So whatever is there on the inner screen, I talk about the mind like the inner screen from which on which various inputs are coming in from the senses and other places. So whatever is there on the inner screen. We have to choose um, the best among that, those options. And we can't begin in our life unless we begin with our life. And like if we have taken a wrong turn, okay, where we are, from there we try to find the best path forward. And then last point I said is Krishna helps us to bring out our best. So Krishna is like the ultimate GPS. Even if we take wrong turns, Krishna is still there to guide us back, to reroute us and take us back. So, no mistake can ever take us out of Krishna's plan. Krishna's plan is not that we make mistakes. Krishna's purpose is that we move towards Him. But Krishna's plan is big enough to include our mistakes. 
and Krishna is just one thought away from us. He is, his purpose is not to catch us when we do wrong, but to catch us when we fall like a loving mother. Help us rise again and move on. So if we feel proud, we look ahead and see how far we have to go. But if we feel discouraged, we look behind and see how in spite of ourselves, Krishna has brought us so far. And that same Lord who has brought us so far will also take us all the way, along all the way, to ultimately to unite with Him. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Thank you. question. When you speak to non-devotee groups, um, do you utilize the name Krishna as God, or do you use the generic God? Mm, okay. Do I use Krishna when I speak to non-devotees? It depends on which audiences they are. If it's a corporate audience or a college audience, where they want us to be secular, then I use the word infinite or simply the whole. So mm, the source, the whole, the infinite. <laughs> Somehow even the word God is uh, has fallen out of favor. Okay. So it's like in the Star Wars they have. May the force be with you. Now if they had said may God be with you, the theaters would become empty. <laughs> so, so actually, so I think the source, infinite, the uh, the ultimate reality, or the, you think the whole and the part is quite fine. Be in harmony with this. So how I explain chanting is that this is this is a affirmation. O part, return to harmony with the whole. <laughs> same thing. It's a Sir Krishna, but put it, O part, return to harmony with the whole. So now when I'm speaking to yogis. They are interested in yoga already and they are open to bhakti yoga. So rather than presenting Krishna as God, I present Krishna as the object of loving yogic meditation. So rather than presenting him as a religious deity or even as the supreme, says, there are great yogis in the past, as they move forward in the yoga, they meditate on this, this conception, this, uh, this vision. So Krishna is the object of loving yogic meditation and if we present Krishna as even especially even if we present Krishna as God if we just present the Krishna conception of God I think that is God is all attractive and Krishna is all attractive then many people are ready to accept it thank you well, you know what GPS means right he was telling that Gen what is the generator? God's positioning system. <laughs> oh, okay. God's positioning system. That's good. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I think I'd heard it many years ago. But I'll use it in future. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Any other comments or questions? Yeah. I've heard that uh, the only offense that can check your progress is Vaishnava Ninda, Vaishnava Buddha. That can, that can stop you cold. Yeah. The only offense that can stop us progress is Vaishnava Ninda. Yeah, basically, <clears throat> the whole idea is that we want to love Krishna. And to love Krishna also means that we love those whom Krishna loves. Mm -hmm. So if we are criticizing devotees, then then, then we are not really acting in our mood of loving service to Krishna. So when Krishna takes away our taste. Mm, that's why it's, it's best to try to avoid as much as possible offense to Krishna. And especially the offense, it's not just criticism. Sometimes circumstantially, if somebody is not doing a service well and has to be done on time, you know, we, may, we may even yell at someone. We can apologize afterwards, but that, that kind of circumstantial strong speech is not as serious offense as is intentionally wanting to pull down a person because uh, because we feel envious of them say somebody gives a very good class so some, somebody gives a very good class and everybody is appreciating the class malice has some malice yeah malice has is, a, is uh, tied in with envy 
Exactly. The Prabhupada uses it like uh, he said that uh, Hiranyakashipu is envious of Prahlad. Yes. But it is meaning in that case malice. It's much more than it's not just it's it's very it's not active, jealousy. It's not yeah, jealousy. It's it's, it's, uh, it's very actively expressed envy, which leads to enmity, which right. wants to bring the other person right, down. Right. So that's serious. That that's. But then the discussions they can be take. Then there's uh, the other extreme where sometimes a discussion needs to be taking place. And one shouldn't be too hypersensitive over, you know, yeah, just having course. a discussion about what's proper and what isn't. Yeah, that's really true. Otherwise, how will we maintain standards? How will we be able to uh, make sure that things are on track? Right. There's definitely an aspect where we have to um, point out if some things are wrong. So it's generally best if we focus on the actions and not on the person. Right. Not say that you are a deviant. That is becomes like too, too direct attack on the person. Right. Now this action, you know, is this in conformity with Prabhupada's teachings? Or how, how, how can we make sense of this action? So basically, for, if the more closer we get to the person, it's like cutting close to the nerve. Right. We cut the hair, there's not much pain. But if we cut a nerve, a person screams. So questioning an action of someone, it may hurt, but it doesn't hurt as much as like questioning the character of a person. Say this action, this that this action is not what Prabhupada would have done. This action is not what Prabhupada would have approved. That's saying one thing. So you are a deviant. That is quite another thing. So if you can keep it as objective as possible. Then even those difficult discussions can also be done among devotees. Mm, yeah, that's true. Yeah, anyone else? Yes, true. There is a lot of talk today in circles, people trying to cultivate spirituality yeah. about yeah. loving oneself. Mm. <clears throat> On the other hand, we have the example of Krishna Kaviraj Goswami. Yeah. Saying, I am a worm in stool, I am more sinful than Jagai and Madhai. No. And then we have some people who are so devoid of self respect, self esteem, that they develop a coping mechanism <coughs> to put everybody else down, that they're all idiots and Mayavadis and whatever they may be, in order that they can feel better about themselves. So the question is, is it that for some people to cultivate self-respect and self-esteem is, is a good thing, a positive thing? Whereas the ultimate objective is that my opinion of myself is just going to get worse and worse as days go by. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Until I end up like Krishna Das Kaviraj Okay. <laughs> Yeah, it's a <laughs> is it that as we grow up spiritually, that our opinion of ourselves becomes worse? Like Sri Daskar just one thinks that I'm lower than a worm in a uh, almond stool. But some people, they, they feel so, that they have no self-respect and then they try to pull down other worlds. So is self-respect necessary to be developed for some people? Okay. We talk about this in three parts. First, let's talk about Krishna Kaviraj Goswami. Mm -hmm. The fact is, that although he speaks like that, that, oh, I am I'm lower than a worm, but still, he is writing the Chaitanya Charita mm -hmm. That means, he doesn't consider his fallen state a disqualification from performing devotional service. Mm -hmm. So there is a, uh, uh, I tend to say, we may be unqualified, but we are never disqualified. Mm. So we may be unqualified. Yes, I don't have necessary purity, knowledge, maturity to serve Krishna. But that's that lack of qualification. But disqualification is you're not allowed to participate. In it. Mm. So his humility does not make him feel I'm disqualified. Mm. His humility does not stop him from rendering service to Krishna. Mm. Rather, with that humility. He actually is more prayerful, more dependent, but still he is serving Krishna. 
wholeheartedly. So I put it this way, these are the five fingers. So this is the soul, this is Krishna. And this is, this is Maya. Or this is disconnection from Krishna, temptation, illusion. So our humility should come here and connect us with Krishna. Or, okay, rather not humility, you could say, let's put it as the opposite of humility. I am very fallen, so I feel guilty. I feel full. So guilt should come here in between us and wrongdoing. Oh, I have committed so many wrongs. I am so fallen. But guilt should stop us from doing wrong. Hmm? But guilt should come between us and the wrongdoing. But sometimes it comes over here. It comes between us and Krishna. You are so fallen that I cannot practice wrong. I am so fallen. Like one person, I was there. I was. I took a taxi once to go from the airport to the temple. I told the taxi driver, "Come to the temple." He said, "I am so sinful. If I come to the temple, the temple will become contaminated." <laughs> no, that is not humility. That is actually a perverse ego. It's like saying, "You know, I am so unclean. If I take bath in the river, the river will become unclean." Well, you are not so unclean. Don't think like that. So, so our impurity can never be bigger than Krishna's purity or Krishna's purifying potency. So, if any emotion is coming between us and Krishna, then we have to see that that is a form of Maya. Mm -hmm. So, I, I use the word. This is guilt, but here, what is there is pseudo guilt, pseudo guilt, pseudo guilt, pseudo false guilt. So, pseudo guilt is where we feel that I am so fallen. But we feel fallen and then we stay fallen. Mm. Oh. But the great devotees, they feel fallen but they don't stay fallen. They are very enterprising in rising toward Krishna. So, they never feel disqualified for their bhakti. And then, if they are such great souls, then why, why do they speak like this? Obviously, they are not fallen, they're more fallen than a worm in his tomb. Why are they speaking like this also? So, I was asked once a question that, does humility have to come at the cost of honesty? <laughs> Should we be honest? Why is he speaking like this? But actually the fact is that his scale of perception is entirely different. He is so absorbed in love for Krishna. And he is so absorbed in feeling Krishna's love for him. That in contrast with the ocean of love that he feels Krishna is giving me, what am I doing for Krishna? So when he feels that ocean of love for Krishna, then, and he feels, actually I am not doing anything. Because he feels I am not reciprocating at all with Krishna, that's why he feels I am so fallen. So his scale of reference itself is very different. And we don't have that scale of reference. We don't, we, we don't really feel, oh Krishna is doing so many things for me. Now, Prabhupada says in a lecture, how do you know whether you are Krishna conscious? He says, if you go in front of the deities and you feel that Krishna is asking you, what are you doing for me? What are you doing for me? If we feel that Krishna is asking us that, then that means we are Krishna conscious. Now, most of us, when we go before Krishna, or at least most people, when they go before Krishna, they ask Krishna, what are you doing for me? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we, really, we don't usually feel that Krishna is showering love on me and I am not reciprocating. Either we feel that I am doing so much struggle to serve Krishna, Krishna is not reciprocating. That's what we feel. So, we can't artificially imitate that level. So, the scale of reference is itself different. It's like, you know, if you are travelling in a plane and you sit right next to the wing. And then if you look, at, look outside and... It seems that the plane is moving very, very, very slowly. You can see the wing and you can see it's, it's almost like it's going for a stroll. But it may be moving at 500 miles per hour. So from that perspective of the sky, the background is simply like a, like a one vast sky is there. So when in the background of that vast sky, even the super fast movement of the plane appears like a very gentle motion. But then when you start looking down, and as the plane starts coming down, we start zooming. How big buildings, bridges, roads, they zoom by. 
So when the scale of reference is the ground, then we can see how fast the plane is moving. When the scale of reference is the sky, the plane seems to be moving very slowly. So our perception depends on our scale of reference. So for great devotees, their perception is entirely different. Or rather the scale of reference, reference is entirely different. And we don't have that scale of reference. So we can respect Rahita uh, Shaka's humility, uh, but we don't, we can't artificially imitate that. Yes. Now, at, at, let me complete this. Now, at our level, we need the confidence that even I can serve Krishna. That I can do something worthwhile with my life. And that much self-esteem or self-respect or whatever word we want to use, we need that. Otherwise, uh, how are we going to serve Krishna? It's like, uh, say, we are our only resource. Nobody else, I cannot replace myself with someone else. <laughs> so, I am my only resource for serving Krishna. And therefore, it's like say, if, if I'm an author and I have a laptop. Now that laptop may be old, that laptop may be slow, that laptop may be messy. But if that is the only laptop I have, if I throw it away, I'll have nothing. So if that is my only resource for writing, then I have to use it as well as I can. Time for Gayatri. Okay. <laughs> so similarly, for all of us, we are our only resource. And we need to, in that much, at least have that much respect that this resource can be used in Krishna's service. So, even if you sometimes feel, I am good for nothing, I am hopeless, I am useless, I am a terrible person, my life is terrible, everything that I do is terrible, and all bad things are happening in our lives. You know, when we feel that we are hopeless and we are helpless, we are powerless, there's a good counterintuitive exercise that we can do. What is that counterintuitive? Uh, my life is hopeless. I am I'm powerless. I feel like that. I can't do anything. Just turn and ask yourself this question. No matter how bad things are, can I make them worse? <laughs> you say, who wants to make them worse? No, that's not the point, but can I make them worse? Think of any situation, we can surely make it worse. You know, I might fall and fracture my foot and I can take a hammer and break my knee also. <laughs> so, you know, whatever situation I am in, I can make it worse. So if I can make it worse, that means I am not as powerless as I think. If I can make it worse, that means I can make it better also. So therefore, each one of us has that potential mm. to make things better. So that much respect at least we need. Mm. And if we understand that I am a part of Krishna, then a part of respecting Krishna is respecting his parts also. I said I, I want to respect other living beings, I want to respect myself also because I am a part of Krishna. Mm. So some amount of self-respect uh, is required so that yes, I can even I can serve Krishna. Even I have some abilities, some gifts which I can use for Krishna's service. Now, acknowledging our ability, that is not necessarily lack of humility. If somebody can sing well, somebody can speak well, somebody can manage well, somebody can cook well. Now acknowledging that is not lack of humility. It is attributing that ability to ourselves alone. It is thinking that this is my ability. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita that ability in people is his gift. So, actually, uh, to have an ability is a gift. Hmm? To, to, uh, to know that we have the ability is a greater gift. And to know that that ability is not ours is the greatest gift. So, if somebody is the first level, they don't even know that they have an ability. Then that is not humility. So that is simply inferiority, low self-esteem. So inferiority complex is, is false ego frustrated. Whereas humility is false ego rejected. 
So false ego frustrated means I want to be great, but there is nothing great about me. <laughs> so I feel frustrated. But false you, false ego rejected means yes I have this ability and I can gloat about that ability, but I have something better to do in my life. I use this ability to serve Krishna to glorify Krishna, and I don't care about how much praise I get or I don't get. So that is false ego rejected. Yeah. False ego um, accepted. That was false ego frustrated. frustrated. Is frustrated is inferiority complex. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. False ego rejected is humility. Mm -hmm. So we do need to. So acknowledging that we have ability is is not lack of humility. So we, if we have some ability, we acknowledge that and we use it in Krishna's service. So not just some devotees. Every one of us needs self respect. And what happens, regarding your last point of devotees pulling people down, that's what happens many times. Say, if some devotee is, uh, gives very nice classes, and some other devotee can also give good classes, but the devotee says, I'll be humble. So I'll not, if I, if I give classes, then I'll become proud. So I'll not give any classes. Mm. But then what happens, that it's, that still that pride is there. Then what happens? That same devotee, if somebody else gives good classes, and then everybody is praising that class. Such a nice class he gave. And this devotee says, "Yes, did you see how much prasad he eats?" Uh -huh. <laughs> so what is happening? That pride is now coming out as envy. So the cure for pride is not the suppression of talent. It is the purification of intent. If I have proud pride. It is that okay. It is not that after I do some praiseworthy service, after that I become proud. It is actually the pride is already there. After I do the some praiseworthy service, I get some reason to express that pride. It's not that the pride is not there. The pride is already there. But if I'm not doing anything praiseworthy, what am I proud of? So it's not that doing service will doing some service well will make us proud. The pride is already there. But when we do that service, two trajectories are possible. One is that we do that service, we get that praise, and then we drink in that praise, and then our pride comes out explicitly. Or we do that service and we connect with Krishna. And when we connect with Krishna, that gives us satisfaction. And then over a period of time, we start realizing actually that absorption in Krishna is far more satisfying than my own glorification. I remember it happened once to me. I had prepared a class very well, every single point well thought out, flowing. And I gave a class, gave the class, and I expected that devotees will appreciate that class. And not one single person appreciated. <laughs> So I was feeling so agitated and then suddenly struck me that while I was preparing the class, I was absorbed. While I was delivering the class, I was absorbed. But now I'm dissatisfied. So I realized that even if somebody praises me, that praise will last for a few moments. But the absorption in Krishna is something that can last forever. So now if I had not given the class, I'm not saying at all that I'm free from pride, I'm still struggling. but. At least I got that realization. But okay, if I speak so that people will praise me, that may or may not come. But if I speak so that I can be absorbed in Krishna, then that can always be with me. So that is, so by, by such ex, by such connection with Krishna, by such experience of absorption in Krishna, gradually the purification of intent happens. Okay, I'm not doing this so that people will praise me. I'm doing this so that I can glorify Krishna and become absorbed in him. So, the cure for pride is not suppression of talent, but it is purification of intent. So, even if somebody becomes proud of their service, that's okay. They'll become proud for some time. The material world is such that it doesn't allow anyone to stay proud for very long. <laughs> so, whatever pride they develop, that will end soon. But the connection with Krishna which they have established, that will stay forever. When we are taking prasadam, we don't need anyone to tell us, now you are full and now you are satisfied. Yeah. We will feel that ourselves. So similarly, when we are absorbed in Krishna, 
just get so much satisfaction. You don't feel that anybody has to tell me that. That's true. Thank you. That's a nice example. Yes, please. So, Maharaj has two books, but he's only got one copy of each. Uh, some of the devotees have seen these. Actually, I have to say, Chaitanya Chan Prabhu, he's like a transcendental Mark Twain. He's got these quotes, just a book full of just one-liners that are just sparkling. They just sparkle. What's the title? This is uh, Gita Wisdom Through Quotes. So, uh, uh, is Ramananda going to be the contact for us? Yeah. Uh, is that how we're going to get these books? If yeah. We want them? Yeah, that would be fun. Okay. So, the other book is on the Ramayana. It is Wisdom from Ramayana, Life and Relationships. So I've taken 20 incidents from the Ramayana and analyzed them, narrated the story and then analyzed them for practical life lessons. So why do good people sometimes do bad things? So Kai Kai, she was a wonderful mother but suddenly she conspired to send Ram away. So why did that happen? Or you know, Swali and Sugriyu, they were brothers and friends but suddenly they became enemies. So why do misunderstandings occur? Why do friends become enemies? When bad things happen to us, at that time, when do we accept it as destiny and when do we endeavor to change it? So when Ram was exiled to the forest, he accepted it as destiny. But when Sita was kidnapped, he didn't accept that as destiny. He fought to get her back. So when to accept as destiny, when to challenge. So what is destiny, how it works, it's explained through various essays. And of course there is the uh, elaborate explanation of that very disturbing pastime in the Ramayana. Why did Ram send Sita away mm. in the forest? So these two books are available and they will be shipped within a week or 10 days from India. I came from Australia and somehow the books which are supposed to get here, there was a new temple, Bhumi Pujan in Sydney and they wanted to distribute those books to the guests over there. So I couldn't get the books here. But I will ship them as soon as I can. So thank you. Uh, from Amazon you can order, but these are books published by mainstream publishers. So the Ramayana book is available on Kindle, but the Gita Wisdom is not.